Holy are the places of connection. And holy are the people who make those connections possible. So many of whom you never see here in front of you on Sunday morning, but who hold this place up just as surely by their devotion and their care. In my own very personal experience, holy indeed is at least one among us whom perhaps the vast majority of you do not know and maybe have not even ever met. My own spouse, John, who's a mystery man, he's right there. <laughs> if you've met him, it's probably because he's come to scoop up a child from a committee meeting I have drugged them to, or he's at Chalice Lighter's choir, or he's attending to our family's needs while I, in fact, am attending to the needs of this, our congregation. He is the one who tells me I'm good at this when I don't believe I am. He is also a preacher's kid himself and in many ways more faithful to the institutions of progressive religion than I will ever be. And back in the days before we had kids, when John and I were just John and I, and I was already a minister, and he was already a professor, and all the responsibilities that we have were already there, it just so happens that John struggled for a long time with the chronic abdominal pain that would come when we least expected it. It was the kind of pain that seemed to have a life of its own that would arrive seemingly whenever it wanted and leave only on its terms. And even though we did all the things and we consulted all the various doctors more often than we like to remember, he and I would end up in the emergency room in the middle of the night telling the same story and getting the same non-answers about a problem that wouldn't go away. One night, not unlike a great many nights before it, the pain was blinding like it often was. And we found ourselves doing yet another one of those two in the morning runs to the emergency room. Yet another one of those times when we were frankly not particularly hopeful, but we were not comfortable with trying to wait it out in the midst of that pain either. And because bodies are confusing, because the condition was clearly chronic over the span of many years, we found ourselves once again about to be sent home. Yes, even in the middle of that blinding pain, we were about to be sent home like always, not knowing what was happening, like always with his fever spiking, like always when one doctor happened to say, you know, surely it could not be your appendix. But since the pain is coming from that area, it can't look hurt to look anyway. And he was all apologetic and honestly a bit abashed, but just for good measure, decided to look around in there just before we hauled ourselves back in the car and drove home as best we could. And when they did apologetically look around in there, what they discovered was the fact that John's appendix had in fact already burst. And it had not ruptured in a contained and easily amended way. It had ruptured some hours before, and the infection was spreading. And that's right, if you at home are following along, we were moments from being discharged from the hospital with a raging abdominal infection and a fully ruptured appendix. And we weren't. Thank God we weren't. And the doctors did what they do, and they rushed him into surgery. By that time, it was early on a weekday morning when the long night had given way to a watery sunrise the way long nights in the hospital often do. And as I said, it was a weekday and we in fact had jobs to do. And so I did what I thought I was called to do while he was in surgery, I called our respected offices and I left dutiful messages about the meetings we would not make it to and the memos we would not be able to write that day. And then I sat myself down on the hallway floor to wait for more news because there were no more chairs in the emergency room and it seemed like someone kept coming out of the operating room every few minutes to tell me that the infection was worse than they thought. And so there I was. I was sitting on the floor in the hallway of a Fairfax hospital still sending email messages about the meetings I couldn't attend, when I looked up and I saw someone surprising standing in front of me. Someone entirely out of context who I couldn't imagine being in that place at that time, it was of all people, a congregant. 
A congregant dropped into this whole other part of my life and my world. Her name was Pam. She was standing there right in front of me and she was saying, Reverend Nancy, Reverend Nancy. And I was in such a daze, it was like I was hearing it through pea soup, like a fog. And all I could think was, oh God, something must be terribly wrong with Pam. <laughs> because here she is in the emergency room, I thought something is terribly wrong with Pam and she probably needs a minister and I do not have the energy to be a pastor right now, I thought these things. As she looked at me with hope in her eyes, hi Pam, I say, trying to act normal readying myself to ferret out whatever medical crisis Pam was in, not quite able to get it together. When she says, Tina in the office at church, she knew I lived close by and wondered if I could drop in on you and John. How are you doing? How are you doing, she asked. And I do not know what Pam and I talked about or what I said or what she did. I know I did not request a casserole to come to my house but I have never forgotten her presence in that hospital hallway, nor the simple fact that it never occurred to me. It never occurred to me in the least until she made it painfully and obviously clear it never occurred to me that she was there to see me, to take care of me, to attend to me, and not the other way around. Because up to that point, it had never occurred to me that this us that we talk about in congregational life included me or my family. The us, it seemed, was some other entity that I existed to be in service to, not something connected to me and to the larger whole. And there are differences I know. There are differences too complicated to get into about the role of the minister and the role of congregants. There are differences you don't even want me to yammer about. Suffice to say that I am never not the minister when I am with you all, nor is Reverend Amanda, we are never not the minister because that role matters and boundaries matter. But you know what? That day I realized that I am also part of something larger than myself. I am also a part of a beloved community which is not only served by me, but in service to me and to my people when we need it the most. Pam showed up, seemingly out of nowhere, and reminded me that us included my people and our pain. And this morning, this us we talk about, this us in which we ask you to put your trust, it includes you too. It isn't just someone else or some professional people or some expert type personage you can trust, sort of, kind of, maybe. It's none of that. It is other people, one of whom happens to be you. And that invitation to trust something larger than yourself, something that includes you in its fold, is a bold thing in this increasingly disconnected and alienated world. You know, the great philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre famously once said, Hell is other people. <laughs> he said the constant negotiations of existing alongside all these messy, complicated, odd, and aggravating other people with their needs and hopes and anxieties and dreams was the definition of hell itself. Hell is other people, he said. And sometimes when you look at how people behave, when you put great bunches of them together in groups or long lines at Disneyland, you can kind of see his point. But I believe perhaps now more than ever, as the world demands cooperation of us, as democracy screams out for communal values, perhaps now more than ever, I believe that hope is other people. Maybe not heaven, but hope. And that is what we need most. Hope for our own lives and what holds them together. Hope and maybe even holiness that sustains us in the most important times. The Protestant theologian, Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber wrote recently that God is always waiting to be made known and that for her, God reveals God's self more fully in the face of the person you are currently most annoyed with than in the sunset. For me, this has always been true. Hope and holiness, God's own self, if ever God had one, 
is made manifest in one another, in how we encounter each other, in how we bump up against each other, in how we hold each other, in how we dream up grand plans together and become more human through the act of making meaning together. We gather in this place for reasons somewhat different than people would assume of a spiritual community. We do not come together to proclaim a single theological truth in this place, nor to create any particular kind of encounter with God or the holy or whatever you want to call it. We do not have a single lesson that I or anybody else is trying to teach you here. Instead, we gather together so that the holy might be made manifest in the ways we interact with and fail and forgive each other in community. We gather together so that something sacred which is larger than any of us can arise from all of us, imperfect as we are and beautiful as we are. And I know it is Stewardship Sunday, and so I need to get about making my pitch here we do not have all day. So I will simply say that none of us, including me, even when I'm not sitting sleeplessly on a hospital floor nor standing here in front of you in my Sunday best, none of us has everything we need to make it through what lies ahead. None of us has the answers. And no one of us will solve the problems that face us today. None of us can fix this alone. But each of us has fragments bits and pieces of the hope it takes to sustain the whole. Each of us has a fragment of effort, a piece of commitment, something to bring to the table of community. Each of us is a part of us, and as such, each of us has some stake in the larger whole. And when it comes to building a community, a community that offers the chance to build trust, that shows what love looks like in public. River Road has been in that good work for a long, long time. And by River Road, I do not mean primarily its ministers. I mean its people. Because I am telling you in this world that is starving for meaning, communities like this one can be a balm for the sickened soul of America. And I am all in. I'm all in for this thing that we call a congregation, this occasional house of cards held together by committee meetings and generosity and your sheer devotion. I am all in because in this bleeding world, I do not have time and neither do you for partial commitments to what matters most. When an empire of oppression stakes its claim around us, when the overlapping hatreds of our day stalk around the edges of our culture, the stakes are too high for half-hearted commitment, and there comes a time to name what is worthwhile and to hold it up with whatever I can muster in devotion and in care. In times like these, we need institutions like this one. We need communities of authenticity and mutuality and imperfection. And so I am all in, my friends. And not just as your minister, but as an actual human person and a part of, my, part of a family. My own family pledges every year at a leadership level, not just because I work here, but because the us that we trust in includes us includes my family, my kids, my husband, me, and we need us not just in the hardest times, but in the daily rhythm of our lives. I am all in because I'm here with all of you in a place you have built for each other. In the place that you sustain for each other and celebrate on a morning like this, I am all in because we are something else, aren't we? And we are something I am so proud to be a part of today and every day.